I know Jehovah. Somebody say that. Say, I, I know, know Jehovah. Jehovah. The series theme, the big idea for this four-part teaching series is we are learning how to grow in our knowledge of God. In the second lesson, I want to teach from this title, I know Jehovah Jireh. I know Jehovah Jireh. The foundational scripture for this series comes from Daniel chapter 11, verse 32. In the B part of the verse, it reads, but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. I said this on last week. I want to repeat it again. It is God's will that 2024 be a strong year for you. Matter of fact, let's exercise our faith muscles. Say this after me. Say 2024 2024 will be be a strong year year for me. me. Let's say it again. 2024 2024 will be be a strong year year for for me. That is God's will for your year. I'm not just on this platform talking. I'm not trying to come up with cute isms. I respect you too much to get on this platform just saying anything. I respect this platform. God said he hold his teachers to a higher standard. I respect this platform and him too much to just get up here saying anything. God wants you to know that this year, his will for this year is that this be a strong year for you. I love, this is not my message, small detour. I love when the Holy Spirit echoes himself in the body of Christ. I spent this past Friday with my brother, Pastor Mike McClure Jr., pastors at a dynamic church here in Birmingham, Rock City. We were talking, we went to high school together, we were talking and catching up on Friday. God is speaking through him and through his platform. They are currently teaching a series this month entitled Strong. And God put it on his heart to let his people know through their platform that 2024 would be a strong year for them. We didn't compare notes. I didn't call him over the holiday break and say, hey, man of God, what are you teaching so I can say it too? The Holy Spirit, when he repeats himself, he's emphasizing something. He wants you to know that he desires this year to be a strong year for you. I need you to agree with him. Other people can say that 2024 is going to be a crazy year. 2024, you better get your tail in here and sit down. Let them say that. You can't say that. We ain't going to fuss at folk. We ain't judging folk. They can say that 2024 is going to be wild. We're not believing for wild. We ain't believing for crazy. We're believing for strength. God's will is also that you carry out great exploits. God wants to use you to do the supernatural. But that strength that God wants to manifest and the supernatural power that God wants you to walk in, the Scripture tells us is connected to our knowledge of God. We talked last week about different ways that you can know someone. We said on last week that in biblical times, one of the ways that you got to know a person was through their name. Names in biblical times were not just what you put on your Starbucks order. It wasn't just what you RSVP'd for the wedding under. In biblical times, your name said something about your character. Your name spoke to your future destiny. And we learned in Exodus chapter 3 on last week that God, when Moses asked him, what is your name? God told him, tell the people Yahweh, 
is sending you. Tell them I am is sending you. We learn that that name Yahweh is where we get the name Jehovah. All of that was reviewed. All of that was reviewed. Now I want to get into some new information talking about I know Jehovah Jireh. New information. Throughout the Old Testament, people often described what God or what Jehovah was like using what we now call compound names of God. So not only did God's names reveal something about his character, his nature, his personality, people in the Old Testament often used what was known as compound names. What is a compound name? A compound name is where individuals took God's name, Yahweh or Jehovah, and they added to it one of God's attributes. Based on my interactions, based on my experience with Jehovah, let me tell you what he is like. Now, you're brilliant. You, you, you are smart. You understand this. Quick history lesson. Most of us have heard of a military leader, governmental leader named Alexander the Great. Military strategist, conqueror, built a vast empire. Alexander was his name. But when his generals, when his soldiers, when people interacted with Alexander and they wanted to describe for others what Alexander was like, they began to know through experience, Alexander is great at strategy. Alexander is great at mobilizing his military forces. Alexander is great at winning battle after battle after battle. Alexander, you want to know about him? Alexander is great. They took Alexander's name and attached an attribute to describe him. And I am saying that throughout the Old Testament, biblical characters also did the same. The compound name that we are going to look at today is Jehovah, and we're going to see what one Old Testament figure, when he wanted to describe some of Jehovah's characteristics, attached an attribute. Jehovah Jireh. Somebody say that. Say Jehovah Jehovah. Jireh. Jireh. Somebody say it again. Say Jehovah Jehovah. Jireh. Now, we've talked about Jehovah. Let's talk for a second about Jireh. What does Jireh mean? Give you a few definitions. Number one, Jireh means to see. Jireh means to see. Second definition, Jireh means to provide. To see, to provide. Now, if you just look at that English word provision, 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 it's made up of two parts. You have pro, which is a prefix. Pro means before. Vision speaks to an ability to see. Provision is not just seeing, it's seeing before. Third definition of gyra, when we add those two meanings together, gyra speaks to the God who doesn't just see. He sees ahead and provides. Isaiah chapter 55, God speaking to us says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways of doing things, how I approach life, is not your ways. As far as the heaven is above the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I am not thinking on the same level as you. I am not behaving on the same level as you. What does that mean as it speaks to provision? It means that when you saw the need that you have is not when he saw it. 
When you started thinking about, okay, 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 how am I going to work this out? Where am I going to get the money from? Where am I going to get the people from? How am I going to make a way? When you started thinking about it, it's not when he started thinking about it. Because he's Jaira. He sees ahead and he provides. We see this name used only one time in Scripture. It comes from Genesis chapter 22. We're going to look at a few of the verses. Genesis chapter 22. I'll give you a brief summary of the story, and then we'll, we'll dive into it. In Genesis chapter 22, we find a man by the name of Abraham who receives an instruction from God. It's an odd instruction. This is a controversial passage of Scripture in the Bible, he receives an instruction from God to take his son, Isaac, to a place and sacrifice him. Now, I'm teaching a lot of different spiritual levels. I have people who are veterans. You could be on the stage teaching this lesson to me. Then I also have people who are newly saved. I also have people who aren't saved. You're, you're, you're exploring things of faith. This can be a story where it can be very easy to get tripped up. I don't want to spend a lot of time on, on this, but because we're talking about God's character, one of the questions that I would have if I was listening and I heard a preacher say, God told Abraham to do what? One of the questions that I would have is why would God tell a father to hurt his kid. I don't have a whole lot of time to dig into that, but I want to give you this. You can meditate it and study it on your own. It helps to understand this text that we're going to look at, Genesis 22, if you know who Abraham is. Abraham is a husband. Abraham is a father. Abraham is an uncle. But in Genesis chapter 20, verse 7, God tells, I think, Abimelech that Abraham is a prophet. Knowing that is important to understanding this text. What do you mean, Pastor M.K.? Prophets, in biblical times and now, speak messages on behalf of God. Sometimes those messages speak to current affairs. Oftentimes, they would speak to future affairs events. God comes to Abraham. Abraham, I am giving you and your wife, Sarah, a son, despite your old age. Abraham tells that to his wife. God is giving the prophet a message indicating what he's about to do. God speaks to Isaiah, unto us, a son is going to be born, unto us a child is going to be given. Isaiah, as a prophet, is speaking to what God is going to do. God is going to birth a, a child, a baby, a Messiah, by the name of Jesus. Sometimes these messages from the prophet came as verbal declarations. I'm telling you this message, I want to say this out of your mouth. Sometimes in Scripture, God would communicate messages of what he was going to do, but he would communicate them through the prophet in nonverbal ways. I want you to do this, prophet, and your action is going to speak to the future. I want you to go here. I want you to do this. I want you to marry this person. And the action is communicating a message about what I'm about to do. Genesis 22 is one of those prophetic actions. Years later, God's only son, Jesus, is going to be sacrificed, crucified in this very area. God is communicating through this action what he's going to do for the world through Jesus. This is a prophetic act. Jesus has come. Most of us aren't prophets, so God is not asking us to recreate this story. Now that we got our background, let's get into it, because there are some things from this story that God wants us to do as well. Genesis chapter 22, talking about Jireh. 
Okay, if God sees ahead and provides, Pastor, I need provision in my life. When I look at my family, when I look at my circumstance, I don't see a lot of provision. How can I see Jaira in my circumstances? Doesn't, doesn't mean a whole lot for me to just see it in the Bible. How can I get this provision to show up Monday through Saturday? Let's explore. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. It says, later on, later on, God tested Abraham's faith and obedience. Abraham, God called, yes, Lord, Abraham replied. Verse 2, take with you your only son, yes, Isaac. I want to stop there, keep it up on the screen. Again, this is a prophetic action. If you're a Bible scholar, you understand Isaac is not Abraham's only son. He also has Ishmael. Is God getting dementia? Is his mind slipping? No, God is speaking to his only son that he's going to sacrifice. Take with you your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much. Go to the land of Moriah. Sacrifice Isaac there as a burnt offering. Listen up. Listen up. Upon one of the mountains, which I am going to point out to you. You're going to take them to Moriah, but you're going to go to the mountain that I point out. Let's keep reading. Verse 3. The next morning, Abraham got up early. Now, I am a parent. If it's ever going to be a morning to sleep in, to drag my feet. This is as good as one is in it. Bible says that Abraham didn't just get up. He got up early. Abraham understood that delayed obedience is disobedience. The next morning, Abraham got up early, chopped wood for a fire upon the altar, saddled his donkey, took with him his son Isaac and two young men who were his servants, and started off to the place, look at this, where God had told them to go. Not the place where he felt like going. Abraham went to the place where God had told him to go. Next verse, on the third day of the journey, Abraham saw the place in the distance. Let's skip ahead. Verse 9. When they, Abraham, Isaac, his two servants, arrived at the place, when Abraham and Isaac, excuse me, when they arrived at the place, listen at this, where God had told Abraham to go. Abraham built an altar, placed the wood in order, ready for the fire, then tied Isaac and laid him on the altar over the wood. Abraham is getting ready to sacrifice his son, Angel hollers out, Abraham, don't touch him. Don't touch him. Abraham did not have to sacrifice his son. Abraham heard a ram stuck in a nearby bush that God had provided to make the sacrifice in place of Isaac. Let's skip to the end of this section, verse 14. Abraham named the place Jehovah provides, and it still go by that name today. I want to look at verse 14 in the American Standard Version. And Abraham called the name of that place. The name of that place. Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mouth of Jehovah, it shall be provided. Pastor, how am I going to see God's provision show up in my life? First thing that you're going to have to understand if you're going to experience Jairus' provision is you have to understand that God's provision is found in a place. If you don't get any point, you got to get this one. God's provision is found in a place. Okay, pastor, if the provision is found in a place, tell me where the place is. 
because I want to go to the place because I need some of that provision. God's provision is found in the place of obedience. Let's go a little deeper. God's provision is found in the places He assigns. The provision that Abraham needed to make the sacrifice, the ram, was not sitting on every mountain. God said, go to the mountain range. I am going to point out the mountain, the one mountain that I want you to go on. It was Abraham's obedience to God's instructions that positioned him to receive God's provision. When Abraham got to the place where God had told him to go, not the place that he felt like was a good spot. Not the place that his mom told him to go. Not the major that his daddy told him to pick. Abraham went to the place where God instructed him to go, and it was in that place of obedience. It didn't look like there was provision there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can't major in that. Ain't no money in that. <laughs> Respect and honor your parents. You never have a right to dishonor them. But if you have to choose between what God is directing you to do and them. You respect them, you honor them, you follow him. Provision was in the place that God had assigned. But I'm not preaching to Abraham. I'm talking to you. I said, I'm not preaching to Abraham Abraham got his ram. I'm preaching to you. Have you climbed up any mountains that God hadn't instructed you to? Have you picked the job based on the pay, based on the benefits, based on the perks, but I didn't talk to him? Have you picked a church based on his instructions to you or based on something else? God will let you climb up any mountain that you want. You grown. You grown. He'll let you climb it. What he's not going to do is let you climb up a mountain he didn't tell you to climb. Then you get mad at him because ain't no provision up there. God does not obligate himself to provide in places that he is not assigned. You're going to experience Jireh where you have to understand that God's provision is found in a place, and that is the place of obedience. Let's go further. Second thing, if you're going to experience Jireh, you have to understand this about obedience. Obedience begins with direction, not details. I got to obey his instructions, but I can't get it twisted. God will always give me direction. Most of the time, he's not going to give me all of the details. Abraham received a general direction from God. Go to the land of Moriah. But he did not receive specific directions about which mountain until he decided to pack up his things and go. 
It was as he obeyed the general direction that he got the specifics. Most of the time, we want God to give us all of the details. Okay, God, who is it? Okay, God, I don't see my team. Who are they? When you gonna send them? God, I don't see the money. Where the money gonna come from? God, answer all of my questions. God, when you answer blank, then I'll move. Doesn't work that way. Most often, when it comes to God's instructions, obedience is going to precede understanding. Obedience is going to come before understanding. When it's a true instruction from God, it's not going to necessarily make sense to your natural mind. God, I don't understand that. As you obey, understanding will come. Don't answer out loud. Does God have to give you all of the explanations to get you to obey? Does he have to tell you everything about everything to get you to step out? No, nah, Pastor, he ain't gotta, he ain't gotta give me no, he ain't gotta give me no details. <laughs> so you're right. So you're right. So you're right. Now, this is a big instruction. We have the hindsight, we have the value of hindsight, excuse me. We know that a ram is going to show up. When God gives Abraham this instruction, the Bible doesn't record everything. I'm sure Abraham has some questions. You want me to do what? With who? What prompted Abraham? To not just obey. The Bible says he got up early. What gave Abraham the confidence to obey God's instructions immediately? Here's the answer. Abraham had a track record of trust with God. This wasn't the first set of instructions that God had given him. Abraham realized years ago, God told me to leave my homeland. And it looked like I was going to lose out, but he gave me another home. Abraham realized that years ago, God told me to leave my family. Based on the instructions, it looked like I was going to be by myself, but God multiplied me. When the king of Sodom said, hey, I want to give you wealth. I want to give you possessions. And Abraham said, "Mm mm-mm, I'm not taking it. Abraham had seen God multiply his finances. The more you experience the faithfulness of God in your life, the easier it's going to be to trust him. I told you in the New Year's message to hold on to hope. You got to remember. Remember the last instruction that he gave you that didn't make sense, but he came through. Remember the last time you didn't understand how he was going to work it out, but he worked it out. As you remember his faithfulness, it becomes easier to trust him. If we're going to experience supernatural provision, We have to understand that God's provision is found in a place. We have to realize that obedience to God's instructions will begin with direction. Don't. No details. Homeless. Homeless what? No details. But it's as you move out that you get the the details. The last instruction that I want to give you to experience Jaira is this. This is a big one. Be sure you get the name right. Okay, let's work this one a little bit. Be sure you get the name right. Now, just in culture, it's a lot of pressure with getting folk names right. You're a teacher, it's the first day of school, you got to go down that roster, you don't know none of these names. That's pressure. You are the announcer. 
announcing people walking across stage on graduation day. That's some pressure to not mess up the name. When I am teaching you the Bible and we get to them Old Testament names, any Bible teacher will tell you we play them names off. But we be fumbling all over them names. And there's some people, you mispronounce their name, they're on trip. Hey, Megan, hey, Megan, tell your dad Michael K. But it's other people who demand, get my name right. Yeah. It's not Megan, it's Megan. <laughs> it ain't Megan, it's Megan. Get the name right. In verse 14, Genesis 22, verse 14, we see Abraham naming the place Jehovah Jireh. I said this on last week, I repeated, in biblical times, the right to name someone or something was a power position. The right or the authority to name something signified that you, your, your words had weight, it signified that you were in the power position. Right after God gave Adam, I said this on last week, right after God gave Adam dominion, one of the responsibilities of that dominion was to name animals. It was a power position. When Eve came to Adam, Adam was, was the domestic head of the home. Adam named her woman. I said this on last week. When God birthed Jesus through Mary and Joseph, he gave them stewardship of baby Jesus, but he retained the right to name the baby. Because the power to name was an authority position. Abraham has the power to choose any name that he wants to give to this mountain. And Abraham chose to name the mountain consistent with God's will and his nature. Abraham could have named the mountain, I didn't know what I was going to do. Abraham could have named the mountain Stressful Place, the place where I was stressed out. Abraham could have named the mountain Close Call. <laughs> Woo, Isaac, that was a close call, wasn't it? That was a close call. <laughs> Abraham understood, I have the power to name this place. And listen to what the scripture said. It said that what Abraham named it is still known to this day. Yes. Why is it still known that? Because there was power in what Abraham named it. Where are you going with this, MK? I am saying that Abraham is not the only person who has the power to name their situations in their life. Just as Abraham had power to name his situation, you do too. You have the power to choose what am I going to name this situation? What am I going to name this place that I'm in? What am I going to name this relationship? What am I going to name this circumstance? And if you are not careful, You will assign a name to a place. You will assign a name to your kids. You will assign a name to your finances, inconsistent with his character, inconsistent with God's nature. Somebody say this, say, I, I have, the power. have the power. Somebody say that again, say, I, I have, the power. have the power. Say this after me, say, I, Get to, Get to choose what name, what name I, will I will give my situations. What name? What name are you giving it? Are you naming the place I can't afford to? Pastor, I want to. I really do. I really do. I want to give. 
I want to tithe. I want to take my family out to eat. I want to take my family on vacation. Pastor, I'm just telling it like it is. I can't afford to. You get to name the place. What name are you giving your employment search? Nobody is hiring. Nobody. If no one is hiring, that means that there are no available jobs for you. And I am saying that your mountain will take on the nature and the character of the name that you give it. I'll never be free from. I'll always struggle with. Seem like everybody catching what's going wrong right now. COVID, RSV, flu. You know we in flu season. You know we in, we in flu season. Everybody catching it. If everybody is catching it, you are a part of everybody. <laughs> I don't know why I'm sneezing. I don't know why I'm sneezing so much. Your mountain is taken on the character of the words that you're speaking. There ain't no good men. None. You know, it's hard out here for us black women. It's hard. It's hard. If they ain't playing for the other team, they in jail. If they ain't in jail, they broke. If they ain't in jail playing for the other team, got money, they ain't in church. It ain't no good men in church. You know, you know, you know, most, most, most churches consist of mostly women. He ain't in church. The Bible didn't say that Abra- the Bible didn't say that God named the mountain. God said, Abraham, you have the power. You get to determine what you're going to speak over this year. You get to determine what you're going to speak over this semester. You get to determine what you're going to speak over your marriage. I am saying, I'm on your team, I ain't fussing. I'm saying to see Jaira, you got to get the name right. You want to see provision, you got to get the name right. Right, you have to align your words with his, because there's power in them. Next week, we're gonna continue this study of compound names. We're gonna look at a fight that God's people found themselves in. In the natural, it didn't look like they could win the fight. In the natural, it didn't look like they were equipped to win. They ain't had a right resume. They didn't have the right resources. In the natural, they were at a disadvantage. But we're going to see next week they won the fight because they had an encounter with Jehovah Nisi. And the same God who helped to give them victory. It's the same God that you and I have. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.